Get set. There we are. Good morning again. What a blessing it is to gather together. And uh, as you can see, there's, a, there's a, a lot going on. And so we're very blessed in that way today. And uh, as you uh, take a look in the bulletin, just quickly, a few things to note. Um, obviously, Vacation Bible School starts this evening at 5.30 is supper and uh, 6 to 8 each of the evenings, uh, tonight through Thursday evening, and then on 7, 7.30 on Thursday evening is the uh, Vacation Bible School program. You're invited to come every evening um, as adults too. Come on by one of the evenings at least and see what's going on. We might put you to work a little bit too, which is okay um, to be a part of things, but uh, love to have you come on out and see the kids as they're taking part in things. And to be in prayer for the, the teachers and the craft people and all the, the food that gets made and things that way. So if you would do that, that would be great. Just a reminder this week, the guys, Coffee, Food, and Bible is Wednesday morning at 7. Um, as we continue on, it will be in the book of Proverbs this week with the Bible Project there. You have the calendar for the month of August um, in the bulletin. And so you have that opportunity to take a look at things. Yes, we're already talking confirmation, young explorers, um, various things that are going on as we already get started into our fall schedule coming up very quickly. Um, the prayer list is there on the back of the outline. You see a few new things that are there to be praying for. Um, continue to pray for Shirley Cooper. She was in the hospital this past week and came home here the other day. Uh, what? She did not come home? She's still there. Okay. I was told one thing and then another, so okay. But she's still in the hospital, so be in prayer for Shirley in that way. She's in Grand Forks. Um, pray for Marty, too. He's not feeling that well himself. So be in prayer for both of them. Uh, the other new things you see there, uh, Val's brother Jeff, to be in prayer for him with his He Fights Cancer. And then Wayne Bradley, Carol's... Um, brother passed away here and they'll be having a graveside this Saturday here at Rose. Um, any other prayer requests or announcements this morning? Oh, yeah, the shoe boxes are coming up before we know it and uh, Shirley wants to remind you that school supplies are on sale <laughs> right now. It'd be a great time to pick up some of that stuff for the shoe boxes with Operation um, Shoe Box. And uh, that'd be an, a great opportunity. Let's talk with God as we begin today. Gracious Heavenly Father, we worship you. You are the one true God. And uh, there's so much going on and a lot of different things. We pray for the Vacation Bible School as it gets started up here um, tonight. Uh, we just ask for your hand of blessing. We know your word doesn't return empty. And we will hear that again today too. And, and Heavenly Father, we uh, see the needs that are there, all the different people. And uh, we, we think especially of Shirley and, and Marty right now that you'd be with them. Uh, watch over them. And uh, we ask that you'd bring healing to Shirley's body. But we put things in your hands. We pray for Val's brother, Jeff. We ask for your healing there. And uh, we pray as well today for um, Wayne Bradley's family too. And Lord, you see all the other needs. We pray for one another. There's so many things that we have going on. And we thank you for little Matthew's um, baptism here today as you will do that work in his heart. Lord, thank you for the gift offered to us. Help us to trust in you and you alone. Do your work today, Lord. Through your word, I pray. Amen. A worship team, if you would get us started. Good morning. Good morning. I invite you to stand as we can praise the Lord, not individually, but as a congregation altogether. Yeah. And a verse I picked out this morning is Psalm 9, verses 1 through 2. 
I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High.
for your work on the cross. We thank you that we have salvation in you and that you give us everything we need for life and breath. We praise you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in that. And you know how songs bring you back to things the first times you remember them? That song, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone, always brings me back to the first time I sang it um, as a solo. And it was at um, my first cousin's funeral, one of my first cousins who passed away suddenly. And it, it's good to be reminded. <laughs> There's blessings in me reminded of memories of people, but to be reminded of the amazing grace of our Lord and Savior. And we're going to find that again today as we look at baptism, as we look at God's Word um, today as well. Let's take a moment. We do this each Sunday. We confess our sin because our, we can turn to the only one who can forgive. And we do it corporately on Sunday mornings. But each day we come to our Savior who offers us that amazing grace and uh, sets us free. Not free to sin or a license to sin, but free from sin.
what he has done for us. Let's uh, use the words you'll see up on the screen if you need them in front of you. It's page 49 there in the hymnal. But join me. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord together today. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you to confess that we have sinned against you in our words, actions, and our thoughts. We come to ask your forgiveness and to seek your great mercy. We come to you in the merits of Jesus Christ, not our own. Look not upon our sins or our iniquity, but wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ so that we may be clean before you. This we pray in his name. Amen. I'm going to call upon our scripture reader today, and I'm not sure how we're going to do this. John, we need to give, would this one work? You're tall. I'm going to let you hold it. I might not be able to read today. Okay. My family's here. So yeah, we, we can do You're going to have to put it close. This is one of the closest cousins I have here. So you have to put this close to you when you do it. I grew up with him. <laughs> so you're going to have to hold it close to your mouth when you do okay. it. So, yep. I'll give it a try. My uh, grandpa still came here in 1918, and uh, this is one of my cousins who... I always tell everybody I got a huge amount of relatives, and this is just one cousin's family. So. <laughs> Rollin. I'll give it a whirl. Once having been asked, okay, I'm reading from Luke 17, verses 20 through 37. Once, having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, Here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to his disciples, The time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. Men will tell you, there he is, or here he is. Do not go running off after them, for the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken, and the other left. Where Lord, they asked. He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Thank you, John. You did great. I've been living with that passage all week. And so uh, we're going to find out what God has for us with that too. Here, I can't get it off, but we'll be okay. Let's confess our faith this morning before we... Uh, have Matthew's baptism today, but let's confess our faith. And this actually is a part of the, the baptismal service sometimes too, buddy. 
we say what we believe. So we're going to do that first, okay? Does that sound good? I wish you could see the smile I'm getting. <laughs> Let's proclaim it together. Would you join me? Let's do that. May it not just come from your lips today, but from your hearts as well. Let's do that. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'll call you guys up at the right time here. I'll get things started. But give me a second. This gets a little tricky. We'll get the water in here. You know, the last time we did a baptism, it was decorated up front too, wasn't it? <laughs> when we did things. But uh, this is going to be an interesting thing. Well, this is a blessed day, and I want to make sure I don't go to the funeral part of things, <laughs> although we die to sin and live to Christ. So, But it's a wonderful thing that's happening today. Um, give me a second here. Dearly beloved, let's hear the command of our Lord Jesus Christ concerning holy baptism. In Matthew 28, it says, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Let's next hear how graciously our Lord Jesus Christ receives little children and opens the door of the kingdom of God for them. It says in Mark chapter 10 that they were bringing little children to Jesus, that he could touch them and bless them. And the disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus, when he saw it, he was moved with indignation. And he said unto them, Don't stop the little children from coming to me, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say unto you, whoever shall not receive the kingdom of God like a little child shall in no wise enter therein. And Jesus took them in his arms and he blessed them, laying his hands upon them. So you see, it's in thankfulness and in faith that we bring our children to the Lord in holy baptism in order that they may share in his blessing and though they are sinful human beings under the law of sin and death, they may become children of God by grace in the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me as we prepare for this eternal and almighty God you are the one we thank you that it's in your church that you have instituted holy baptism and it's in your name and it's only because your word is connected with the water today you promise to be our father to save us from sin by you Jesus the son our redeemer and you promise to regenerate and sanctify us by your spirit we pray today that you'd receive little Matthew here when he's brought before you. Let him receive the eternal blessings of holy baptism and grant that he may grow up in your church, O God, as your child. And may the fear and the love of God prevail in his home. Teach him, Lord, to fear and to love you and preserve him from all evil until he shall come unto you in your heavenly kingdom. We pray this in your name. Amen. So I'm going to slide this forward. Let's have you guys come on up and sponsors as well if you would stand over to the side there too on that side over there. It would be great. So you know there's a few questions that I have to ask as we begin. For you as parents, first of all, Justin and Elizabeth, do you desire that Matthew shall be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? If so, answer, we do. 
Here's the tougher one, which you know about. Do you promise to instruct him in the word of God and to nurture him in the chastening and the admonition of the Lord? If so, answer, we do. And you know that you can only do that with God's strength. You can't do it in your own. You need him to help. May the Lord keep your going out and your coming from this time forth and from forevermore. And Matthew, I'm going to make the sign of the cross on your brow and on your breast. You know why I do that? To remind you that you will be a child of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to bring him close here. Matthew Michael Stowe. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We'll wipe this off a little bit, buddy. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has now made you his child in holy baptism and has received you into his believing church, may he strengthen you with his grace for life everlasting. Amen. Amen. And there you go. I'll keep that. You did great, bud. Let's give God a big round of applause. God just did a wonderful work. <laughs> now, for you as sponsors, Alex and Paul, um, I have a hundred questions for you guys. No, just, just something here to be reminded of. You as sponsors to be witnesses that Matthew has been baptized in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. And you are also to remember him before God in your prayers. And to make certain as far as possible that he's reared in the faith and the fear of God. And as he grows, he may grow up into Christ just as now he's been grafted into Christ through baptism. So you see, we believe that God gives the gift of faith and baptism, but that that gift will be lost unless the child is taught the word of God, given a Christian example to follow, and upheld by prayer. Justin Elizabeth, that's first of all your responsibility as parents and then as sponsors, but it's also our responsibility as a congregation to be praying. May we all be faithful in that responsibility and privilege. Peace be with you all. Amen. And you guys can sit down. It would be great. Now we should take offering, right, to get his college fund started? <laughs> No, we give back to the God each, each Sunday um, and we worship him in that way as we, we give from what he's given to us. So I'll call the ushers forward and let's take a moment and a time of offering at this point. And I did go grab the plates, so we're good. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for what you've done in Matthew's heart and we pray that these gifts that are given today would be used so that your word would go for forth so people would know you and have that daily living personal relationship with you. Do your work today, Lord. We pray in your name. Amen. And you guys can keep them in the back and we'll sit there. Come on up for the children's message, if you would. And I forgot to do that before the baptism. Sometimes I have the kids come sit up front, which is kind of fun. But come on up today, guys. Boy, I hope there's more than four of you at, at um, Vacation Bible School today. Maybe they're all getting ready for it in that way. So. <laughs> We get the big kids coming up too, which is fine. We, 
Yeah. <laughs> right there. Um, we've been doing Jesus A through Z, and there's my book is gone somewhere. It was up here with that way. But we've been doing Jesus A through Z, and so it's a wonderful book, and we should get you guys one before you leave today, so you've got one. We've got a few extras in that way. It's a wonderful way of doing it. So let's go through A, a through Z as fast as we can here. Here we go. Jesus with A. Alpha and Omega. Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. B, the bread of life. C, are we just going to let these two do it? <laughs> C, Christ. Christ. D, door. the door. He's the way. E, he is eternal life. F, he's the foundation. G, he's the good shepherd. H, he's the high priest. I. Theo, do you remember I? She's whispering it to you really quick. I am. I am. Yeah, Jesus is the I am. He's God. He always was, always as it will be. H I J. Jesus is Jesus. <laughs> He's the Savior. That's what Jesus means to save mankind. K. King of Kings. King of Kings. And then. Last week we did L. Do you remember what L was? Should we ask them and see if they were paying attention? Yeah, let's see if they were paying attention last week. What was L? Don't be afraid. What's the guess? Lord. Lord, that would have been a good one, but it wasn't that one for this one. Love, it wasn't that. It wasn't Lamb of God either, even though that would have been a good one. He's the light of the world. You had that one down, didn't you, Simon? <laughs> He's the light of the world. All those other L's are good. But in that book that we have, it, it's the light of the world. That, that leads us to M. Now, M, any guesses to what M might be? Or did you already look it up in your book at home? What is it? He's the man of sorrows. Jesus is fully God, fully man. And in the Old Testament, there's a um, prophecy that says that Jesus will be the man of sorrows. Jesus was fully man so he could be that sacrifice, but he would know every sorrow that we know. You guys know what sorrows are? Sorrows are tough things that make us sorrow or make us sad. Jesus has gone through everything that we have ever gone through. And he lived that perfect life. He became the man of sorrows and he died for you and me. And so we can always remember that, that he's taken it for us. So he's the man of sorrows. All right, since we've got five of you up here, you can take five pieces of candy at the end today. But you share either two or three, okay? Okay. You share two or three with these hungry people out here. <laughs> okay? Let's pray, and then you guys can head down. Lord, thank you that you are the one true God, Jesus. And we pray that today, <laughs> that as we go through the rest of this day and we live along the way, that we will know you as our Savior and walk with you each step away. Help these kids to remember that you're right there for them. I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. You guys can head on down. Good job. Let's sing the song before the message here, and I am going to shed my coat, if that's okay. There we go. And, uh, and spruce was an, an oven today. I didn't wear the coat at spruce. But let's sing this song as we talk about the return of Jesus Christ today, this song, Christ Returneth. So let's sing it together. Go ahead, Debbie.
If you'd open your Bibles again and uh, turn to Luke 17 as we finally finish Luke 17 off with these verses in 20 through 37. As I told you before, I've been living with this all week. This is a tough passage of Scripture. There are a lot of interpretations that some people try to give to it. So seeking out what God wants and what He shares is the key. We want to catch what Jesus has for you and me. And I've entitled this Kingdom Come. We use that phrase at different times with the kingdom. And uh, we do it in the Lord's Prayer, don't we? The second article of the Lord's Prayer is, Thy kingdom come. Now, a little catechism lesson or a little confirmation lesson real quickly here. When we do that petition and Luther put down, what does this mean? And he, his answer was, the kingdom of God comes indeed of itself without our prayer. We don't need to pray for God's kingdom to come. But he says, but we pray in this petition that it may come also to us. We're praying for the kingdom of God to come. Now, the question that he asks next is, how is this done? And the answer to that is when our Heavenly Father gives us His Holy Spirit, so that by His grace we may believe His Holy Word and live a godly life here on earth and in heaven forever. You see, when we talk about the kingdom of God, we talk about it in two ways in scripture one is the kingdom of grace the kingdom of grace is where god has given us his holy spirit if we believe and we trust in him the word of god through that we believe the holy spirit then god himself lives within us we don't become gods but the kingdom of god then is in the heart of people and then there's the kingdom of glory heaven that's where things come to full fruition. If we believe, one day we will spend eternity with our Lord and Savior rather than apart from Him. And so as we talk about the kingdom of God and as Jesus talked about it here on earth, He talked about it in that sense as we'll see and we'll discuss here a little bit. But the kingdom of God would come. And He talks about that coming kingdom when one day he will come again and we'll, we'll hit that. Now, as you think about that, I was thinking, where else do we ask the, Jesus to come on a regular basis? Think food. What's the prayer that we sometimes use at the beginning of eating? Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. I found this wonderful picture, uh, a painting of that idea of asking Jesus to come each time now this accidentally happened at our house the other day we set up too many chairs at the table and there was one extra chair but it's always that reminder as you pray come Lord Jesus be our guest some people actually leave an empty chair every day at their table to be reminded that they're asking Jesus to come and to be with them <laughs> now there was a little boy who wanted a bicycle so he decided that he would pray to that so he had turned on the TV and he was watching a church television program a very traditional service and he saw how the minister prayed so at the end of the day he got down on his knees and, and he prayed like this he said Lord if it is your sovereign will and in your eternal plan that I can get myself a bicycle in your time and according to your will oh God would you please get me a bicycle in Jesus name I pray Amen. Two days later, there was still no bicycle. So he began to think he needed a different prayer. So he turned on the TV again, and he happened to be watching another type of ministry in operation. So that night, he knelt by his bed, and he got on his knees, and he said, Lord, I declare my need for a bicycle, and I declare that it'll be a nice blue-colored bicycle. And I declared that it will be delivered to my home within 24 hours. I lay claim to it. Amen. And after several days and still not receiving his bicycle, he was passing along this hallway and his mom was watching him and he passed by this hallway and it had a statue of the Virgin Mary 
there on one of the shelves. So he took the statue off the shelf, not thinking anybody was watching him, and he disappeared somewhere. And his mother was, of course, seeing this. So later that night, he got down by his bed again, and he began to pray. He figured he had to use some other technique. So he said, Dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again. <laughs> now, we chuckle at that. <laughs> But you can see how we can spin things in such a wrong way. <laughs> and we can get caught up with all the externals rather than a real relationship with Jesus Christ. When we look at this passage from Luke 17, 20 through 37, we can ask this question, what's wrong? <laughs> what's wrong with the scenario here in Luke 17? And that starts out with the question that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, were asking. They had a wrong question and a wrong motive. And Jesus talks about that there. I don't know if he's talking directly to his disciples as he's talking to this, but he makes mention of this. And Luke writes this down, that the Pharisees had come to him with this wrong question and motive where they say, when will the kingdom of God come? When will it come? And then it's copied down for us. It's there for us. It's for the disciples. It's for us. Jesus gives the answer. You see, the Pharisees wanted a political kingdom. They thought of the Messiah coming in like a King David or a Judas Maccabeus and coming in and wiping out the enemy and setting up the kingdom there in Jerusalem. That's what they were thinking when they were thinking of a Messiah coming to get rid of the enemies, the physical, political enemies, that this Messiah would come in riding the proverbial white horse with the white hat, guns ablazing, probably not guns at that time, but chariots and this army coming in. That's what they saw was this leader in that way. They wanted a grand display of power. That's why they kept asking Jesus for signs. Jesus, show us a sign so that we can know that you're the Messiah. And Jesus said, a wicked generation looks for signs. The sign has already been given. Just as Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days in the belly of the earth. They were looking for that physical kingdom. They were looking for somebody to come in in that way, but how did Jesus come? <laughs> Born in a manger born in a barn. He came humbly. When he grew up, he didn't grow up in a palace. He grew up in a carpenter's house in Nazareth. They were looking for him to do all these things, but he was reaching out to people because the kingdom that he was bringing was a spiritual kingdom, the kingdom that he would set up in the hearts of people and bring salvation. It's great we're going through the A through Z with who Jesus is because it reminds us why Jesus came <laughs> and who he is. And Jesus says to it, him, or I don't know if he was talking to the Pharisees, but to the disciples at least are hearing this, that the kingdom of God doesn't come, at least to the Pharisees, it doesn't come with your careful observation. Just because you're looking for the kingdom isn't going to make it come. You're going to have people, Jesus says, who say, here it is, there it is. <laughs> and that's, Jesus says very clearly, <laughs> he says, don't follow that. <laughs> don't go running after those things. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Where is the kingdom of God, Jesus says. Where is the kingdom of God? Jesus says, it is within you. Or that word within can be translated, it is among you. Jesus is right there in their midst. And they're missing it. Jesus is talking about how it is for us today too if the idea is that he's in you, because that's where the kingdom of God is. It's among you. It's where Jesus is. It's in the hearts of believers. It's in the congregation where true believers gather. That's where the kingdom of God is on earth. The point to all this is that it's the true spiritual kingdom. 
It's not talking about this physical kingdom. One day we will have a new heaven and a new earth at the end of time. But Jesus is talking to them and he's pointing out this fact. They're missing that truth. (laughs) The true spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of grace. In Matthew 27, 11, Pilate kind of got caught into all this later on with Jesus because you may remember the question that Pilate asked Jesus. He said, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says to him, it is as you say. Jesus is the king. (laughs) But the kingdom that he wanted to set up was the kingdom in the hearts of people. The Pharisees had the wrong question, the wrong motives. So I'm going to ask a question to you and me today. When do you and I have the wrong motives? <laughs> when we're like the Pharisees. We, ought, we can't be like them, right? When do we fall into these things? <laughs> when we start to look for the blessedness of God in outward circumstances rather than inner peace and in the joy that only he can give. We might say things like, if only I could win that prize, if only I could gain that job, if I could secure that friendship, God. (laughs) Maybe if I could earn that income, if I could get that grade, how good my life would be. When we base it on our religious experiences and we try to get these experiences rather than basing it upon the truth of what Christ has done and what he can do for us. When we say to God, we need to get this gift, God, if you give us this gift, then we'll believe. When we wait for the circumstances to be just right, and we look for the, we long for the future rather than to live in what Christ has done for you and me today. Even though it's filled with challenges and joys and all the things that life comes, we base it on what he has done for you and me today. (laughs) And see, that's what Jesus does next with his disciples because it tells us there in the next verses in 22 and following that he turns to the disciples and he begins, he says to them, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you won't see it. He he begins to warn them of some wrong beliefs here is what he begins to do. He says, you're going to hit a time where you're going to want me to come back. (laughs) But you're not going to see that. He says, and he uses the same words he did with the Pharisees before this. Some people are going to come to you and tell them, here it is, here he is, there he is. (laughs) And Jesus says, don't go running after them. (laughs) Don't go running after them. Don't go there (laughs) with that aspect. I mean, think about it. Think about all the cult tragedies that would never have happened if people had taken these two verses seriously. You'll see the picture up on the screen and you see the pictures of Jim Jones and David Koresh and then the, the uh, um, Heaven's Gate cult massacre. And there's many more I can do. It. People who have claimed to be the Messiah or people said, there's the Messiah. There it is. Here is the Messiah. <laughs> and all the people that died because they listened to somebody that said, the kingdom is over there. The kingdom is over here. Look, there's the Messiah. <laughs> You see, if somebody's telling you that the Messiah has come, Jesus says, don't go there. (laughs) Because he's going to tell us what the coming of Jesus is like and what it is. Because when the coming of Jesus occurs again, everybody will know it. (laughs) Not just some people trying to tell you that this is or that is. (laughs) Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. It'll be evident to everybody when Jesus comes again. And in this little portion, I want to just jump to verse 25. He says, first of all, first, first things first, Jesus, he says, this Messiah, he's talking about himself, is going to have to suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. 
Jesus is talking about his death to come, fulfilling his mission, <laughs> that he would willingly go to the cross for you and me. And he would bring that redemption. He would pay the price. He would fulfill God's plan. He would accomplish the mission to bring salvation. You see, the real message to all of this, what Jesus is now going to tell us, the real message is to be ready. To be ready. To be ready for that day <laughs> when we meet eternity. And by the way, there are two ways that you and I can meet eternity. One is if we die. We'll face eternity. Jesus will cover that with what he's got there. But the other way is when the Son of Man comes again in all his glory. And when Jesus comes the second time, the first time he came to bring salvation, the second time he comes in full judgment as King of kings and Lord of lords. And if we're a believer, a true believer, if we're trusting in him, that's a wonderful day because he'll come to take us home. But if you don't believe or you've been playing the game, what kind of day is that? It's a day of dread because you'll know the truth in all its fullness and you will not have accepted it. By the way, you ever people complain about the fact that there's um, too much hellfire and judgment sermons or they say there's not enough of them? Jesus talks about hellfire and judgment right here, doesn't he, when he brings up the examples that he'll bring. Well, what does he say first of all? The coming of the Son of Man will be like lightning. By the way, did, on Friday night, did you guys see the lightning show? I mean, there was the um, fireworks over at the fair, but if you looked to the south and looked over Grigla, <laughs> they were getting nailed, but it was constant heat lightning. And lightning is something, you know, today we can catch pictures of it because we can take movies, right? And we can catch the lightning. But if you were somebody sitting with a camera to try and catch the moment when the lightning goes, it'd be pretty hard, <laughs> Because those electrons go from cloud to cloud or from the clouds to the earth or from the earth to the clouds. They go, boom, like that. And Jesus says that the coming of the Son of Man will be like that. For as the lightning goes from one side of the sky to the other. And we read in Scripture that it will be that loud shout from heaven in 1 Thessalonians 14. The angel will make that sound, sound the trumpet. It says in 1 Corinthians 15 that we will all be changed in a twinkling of an eye. And we'll know. <laughs> so Jesus says, if anybody's telling you that these are things that are going to happen at a certain time or whatever, know, know that when it happens, it will happen. <laughs> and then he uses two examples here, doesn't he? The first example, he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. They were eating, they were drinking, they were given in marriage and marrying and until the day Noah entered the ark and then the flood came and destroyed them all. Judgment came. The rain fell, the waters from the deep filled the earth. And that judgment came as God brought it. There's an old song that says, I wish we'd all been ready. <laughs> By the way, Jesus bringing up these examples, some people today tell you there's no way that the ark could have happened. Jesus is bringing it up. It's an actual event. You don't have to travel to Kentucky to see the ark, although it would be a great thing to do, the one that's been built by Answers in Genesis. It's a wonderful thing to get that picture of it. But... That's the way God saved those eight people and the animals of the earth. <laughs> but he said it'll be like that in that day. And then he uses the second example. It's the same as it is in the days of Lot. What were they doing in those days? They were buying and selling. They were planting. They were building. They were eating and drinking. <laughs> but the day that Lot left Sodom, 
God rained down fire and brimstone and judgment occurred. By the way, are you and I buying and selling, eating and drinking? You know, this is, this is talking about some of those things that, that were happening back then and, and the evils that are there, but it's not the evil that it, it's getting pointed out here. There is the wickedness and the sin which was in those things, but what really happened was the indifference to God. The indifference to God. Does that sound at all like our day? It's been that way throughout time. And Christ could come at any point. <laughs> Judgment can come at any point. <laughs> See, the message is to be ready. Matthew 24, 44, Jesus said, um, be ready for the Son of Man will come at an hour you don't expect. Matthew 25, 31, in the next chapter, he says, keep watch because you don't know the day or the hour. If anybody tells you they know exactly when, don't listen to it. Or if somebody says there's the Messiah or that he's already come, don't listen to that. Jesus is telling them, be ready, persevere. <laughs> That's the real message here. And then in verses 30 through 32, he says, don't look back. <laughs> the day of the Son of Man will be revealed, verse 30 says. That word revealed is the, the word apocalypse. The book of Revelation is the apocalypse of Jesus Christus. It's the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. It's when Jesus Christ will be revealed. That's the whole key. <laughs> is the revealing of Jesus Christ. And, and we will know that. What does he say about things here? He says, even so, when that day comes, when the Son of Man is revealed, in that day, if you're up on the housetop and the goods are in the house, don't go down after the other goods. <laughs> and likewise, if you're in the field, don't turn back to get things. <laughs> and he says, remember Lot's wife. Do you remember what Lot's wife did? I want to remind you with, with Sodom, Abraham pleaded for Sodom and Gomorrah. Pleaded with God. He got it down to 10. If there was 10 righteous people, the whole place could have been saved. And as Lot and his family are leaving, what does Lot's wife do? She turns back to those things. Don't go back to the things that are taking you away from God because judgment is sure. It's hard to say that because there are many things that I find myself going back to. If you were in a house fire, what would you go after? We had that question the other day. <laughs> What's the one thing you would take with you? <laughs> well, the one thing to be for sure is don't go back in. <laughs> and that's what he's saying here. Don't turn back. Don't hang on to the things of the world. And, I mean, that day when Christ comes, everybody will know. Final victory for believers, the final judgment for believers and unbelievers alike. But it's so good to know that Jesus has taken it for us. <laughs> you remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus? He came to Jesus and he wanted to follow Jesus. He said, what must I do? Jesus looked into his heart and he knew what this guy needed to give up. He said, go sell everything you have and follow me. He couldn't do it. And then the disciples, Jesus said to the disciples, he said, it's easier for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. Anybody here the size of a camel? Oh, even if we took one of you, could we fit you through an eye of a needle? A gate? <laughs> it's not the gate. It's literally the eye of the needle because you know the next question. The disciples said to Jesus, well, then who can be saved? They realized it was impossible. It was impossible. And then Jesus says, what's impossible with men is possible with God. 
Salvation is possible only through Jesus Christ. And it's an amazing thing to think about what Christ has done. <laughs> He's offered us a gift that we could never, as we reach and go with that. Because that's what the next part is. Um, by the way, I, I, I was reading a thing about R.C. Sproul the other day. R.C. Sproul um, tells the story one time. He, in 1993, there was a terrible Amtrak accident. Mobile Bay um, it was on its way, the, the, the train was on its way, this is the actual picture of it, it was on its way to Florida. R.C. Sproul tells the story because he was on the train when they hit this big thing and it, his wife got thrown into the safety netting, they were in his room and he got thrown up against the wall and, and he knew something was wrong right away. And so he says to his wife, he says, Vesta, he says, we got to get out of here. And she's like, no, 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 I got to get my shoes. And he's like, no, 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 no. We got to get out of here. <laughs> and she's like, no, 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 I've got to get my suitcase. Once they got outside the train, she saw really quickly that they needed to get out of there <laughs> to not look back or to get things. And it's the same with us. When we have that opportunity, <laughs> don't, don't go back for things. Follow. Believe. See, that's what Jesus brings up next. Do you see it? Take a look there um, at verse 33. <laughs> Jesus says, whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. <laughs> we read that first of all and we go, what? <laughs> Jesus says, if we try to do life on our own terms and we try to gain things even religiously, we need to lose our life. In Galatians 2.20, Paul said, he said, I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live, but Jesus Christ now lives in me. When Jesus went to the disciples, what did he say? Follow me. And what did the disciples do? Some of them dropped their nets. They left everything and followed him. When we lose our life in him is when we really find it. In, in Hebrews 12, it says, in verses 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, since we are, are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let's run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despised its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. See, the message of Scripture is to believe and then to persevere and to live in that belief, <laughs> to not live in our own ways, but to follow Jesus Christ. What was the thing today? It was... All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them, teaching them to observe whatsoever I've commanded you. <laughs> See, that's what Jesus wants us to do is to follow him. <laughs> Matthew 16, 24 through 25, Jesus said, if any man would come after me, <laughs> let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. See, the last thing that Jesus brings up in 34 through 37 is that death and judgment will come. In verses 34 and 35, it says, one will be saved and one won't. <laughs> as as the, the two are um, at the, in bed, one will be saved, one won't. The two that are um, out in the, is it the field? One will be saved, one won't. <laughs> See, when judgment comes, we don't know when death will come for one person or the next. I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe some big millstone could fall right now and just kill you, Grant. I hope it doesn't. But it, 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 it what if it just fell on Joyce instead? <laughs> one will be saved, one left. We don't know when death will come. 
We don't know when these things will come, but we need to be ready. <laughs> and on that day of judgment, when Christ comes again, there might be two people together. One will be saved and one will be left. Are we ready to face eternity? <laughs> That's the reality of life. And then that, that crazy verse at the end, because they say, where, Lord? And then what does Jesus say? <laughs> Where there's a dead body, there the vultures will gather. By the way, you can interpret vultures. You can interpret it. It can either be vultures or eagles. That's what this picture is, right? Now, you and I live up north here. We understand eagles and vultures. If you see the buzzards flying in the sky, what do you know is around somewhere? A dead body of some kind. When you go drive along the roads, where do we see? I mean, we see a, a dead deer. What do you see around it? <laughs> a, a bunch of eagles. There's other interpretations, and we can do a whole bunch of other things, but what it's talking about, death will come. Death will come, and that's a finality, and that's when judgment is. When death hits, there's no second chance. I want to give you this because as we've looked at all this, this is the key really to things and sometimes we get caught up in a lot of different things and don't get me wrong, Bible prophecy is important. It's important to study it. But I want you to catch something about Bible prophecy. It's not given so that we can sit around and speculate <laughs> about what will happen in the future. It's always given so that we can apply it to how we live in the present in the light of what God has promised to do in the future. If you're just studying prophecy because you, it's interesting and you want to figure it out, that's fine, but that's not the purpose of it. The purpose of it is so that you and I will be ready, that we will understand how it, personally how it is to be a part of God's kingdom because Jesus makes it clear that judgment will come and if we don't have him, we don't accept what he has done, that judgment will lead to an eternity apart of him, apart from him. To be in God's kingdom, we must be personally related to God's king, to King Jesus. And we can faithfully await that consummation when he comes again. Jesus is saying, be ready. So you and I can say, like the end of Scripture says, in the end of Revelation, it says, Maranatha. What does Maranatha mean? Come, Lord. <laughs> Come. Come, Lord Jesus. May you know him and follow him. And be careful. Don't listen to the people who say he's already come or he's over here, or he's this. <laughs> know that he will come. And don't try and find a prayer like that little boy and hold out on Jesus and say, you want to see your mom? <laughs> Rather pray to Jesus and say, your will be done. Your kingdom come. Trust him. Lord, thank you for your word today. Thank you for what you've done. Holy Spirit, you use your word to call to us. You know each heart here. You know my heart. <laughs> Draw us unto you. Lord, do your work. Thank you today for little Matthew too. May he grow in your grace and the knowledge of you. I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together and close off the service today by singing. Take a deep breath before you sing this one when the roll is called up yonder, but I hope you can sing it fully and say, I'll be there <laughs> if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's sing it together.
Aren't you glad that it's not based on how good and how much good we've done, <laughs> but what Christ has done? And may the Lord help us to truly believe and live it. Let's pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may the Lord himself bless each of you, keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one true and living God. Amen and amen. Oh.